everyone and welcome back to a year in the TikTok of J Bay. So today we are going to go ahead and look through some more TikToks. Um I'm not entirely sure how many we will go through. My goal is to keep this um to about 30 35 minutes before I go into my rambles. Um and I'm going to try to keep my rambles to like 5 or 10 minutes <laughs> in hopes that I can continue to put out videos on a regular basis. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into it. As a plus-size traveler and travel enthusiast, I've been on a mission to make travel more accessible and comfortable for everyone. Throughout my journey, I've noticed a lack of resources specifically catering to the needs of plus-size travelers. So I decided to take matters into my own hands and create something that can truly make a difference for plus-size travelers. Now introducing my carefully curated plus-size travel checklist. This checklist includes 30 essential items that have been selected with plus-size travelers in mind. Making your journey smoother and stress-free. You can find the complete list by clicking the link in my bio. Let's embark on unforgettable adventures together. Embracing the joy of travel with confidence and ease. Happy travels, my fellow plus size wanderers. As a so I'm including this mostly because uh, that's something that we'll probably look into once I get through it. Like, Jaybay has so much extra with her stuff. She has her TikTok. She has a YouTube. She has a blog. She has... Apparently this checklist, which I am betting has a bunch of Amazon affiliate links. And I'm very curious about all of this. There's so much to go through with Jaybay. This is just going to be like, she she's going to have her year in the TikTok, but I feel like we're also going to have some additional things to go through with her. Simply because she is so active and so outspoken. Um, but let's let's continue on. I'm very curious about this Ultimate Plus Size Travel Checklist, but I think that's going to be like an all-in-due-time sort of thing. Air travel poses significant challenges for plus-size individuals due to inconsistent policies across airlines. It's incredibly frustrating and anxiety-inducing to navigate the uncertainty of keeping our seats on flights. That's why I initiated my plus-size travel petition urging the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, to mandate that all airlines clearly state their customer size policies within their operations and on their websites. Join me in advocating for change to ensure a more transparent and inclusive air travel experience for everybody, regardless of their size. Click the link in my bio to sign my petition today. Here's the thing. I don't think that this is a bad idea at all. I would actually love for airlines to have their policies up front and uh, the, the transparency of differences, you know, between the different airlines. Granted, I don't travel, so I don't know entirely what that entails. My only issue is, is that she's advocating for this strictly on the customer of size policy, where I think she would get more buy-in if she made it generalized and she can mention the customer of size policy. This is kind of the, the issue that I see with a lot of activists. And it's something that I've kind of learned and am learning more as I am getting into my job since I'm an advocate for ESL students is that you can advocate for your particular group, but you're going to get far more buy-in if you are also advocating for uh, what's essentially like a quality of life for everyone as well. And I'm actually going to get into that a little bit with my rambles today, but to stay on topic here, you this is this is one of those things in general, even with fat activists. Fat activists have some like reasonable points in various aspects of their rhetoric for their uh like size inclusivity stuff if they were more advocating for test seats outside of um rides at amusement parks i think most people could get behind that if more um research on uh obesity and um potential conditions that can arise from obesity that doctors should potentially look out for when patients come in complaining of certain things that can be attributed to obesity, but this is also like a common thing, like can certain cancers, that sort of thing. And but that can be extrapolated, that can be widened to also include uh things like women. Like women so many women have been told, you know, periods are supposed to be painful and then later are diagnosed with endometriosis blah, 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 I cannot speak. Uh, endometriosis uh, that has progressed to the point where they, like, lose an ovary or something. So there's ways to advocate for procedures and policies to be put in place that can be inclusive of people outside of fat acceptance, outside of obesity, 
that would allow for more buy-in, but they are so honed in, it feels, it, this is my perspective, but it seems like they are so honed in on their own victimhood that they don't want to include others in that unless it is like a hot ticket group that they feel adds legitimacy. Because it's saying something about, you know, at, like with the with the doctor's office also advocating for women since a lot of morbidly obese women also will have these comorbidities of endometriosis or PCOS because obesity also ties into that and that being part of like a potential procedure or, or policy when it comes to diagnosing or investigation alongside, you know, the lose weight, which I know that they wouldn't be happy with. But I, there are like certain aspects that I, I can see adding to that. But unless it falls under race or disability or... um. Oh, who else have they aligned themselves with? I feel like they've also aligned themselves with the queer community on several occasions. When they, when they are only pandering to the, like, hot ticket groups that get more press, rather than looking at it more holistically and including groups that also don't tend to uh, get a whole lot of recognition in their needs, it just comes across as disingenuous and like they're, they're almost children throwing temper tantrums. I hope I'm making sense with all this, but let's let's move on. Hey y'all, it's your girl Jay and I'm so excited because today I'm trying out Kinflight. They carry bras up to a size 7X with cups A through M and band sides up to a 62. This is my current bra. And here's me in the Kinflight Freedom Bra Midi. I'm wearing a size 7XL in the Sunrise Blossom color. This Kinflight bra offers way more support than my current bra, and I am obsessed with the color. Definitely my new fave. Next up is the Kinflight Dream Bra in a size 7XL in the Galaxy Blue color. This dream bra is temperature regulating to keep you cool, which I love. And last but not least, we have the Kinflight Rise Bra, an adjustable bra for lifted support, and it reduces bounce. These bras are also sweat wicking and odor resistant. It also comes with these Velcro straps so that you can adjust the fit. And here's what the bras look like underneath your clothes. They keep everything in place. Kinflight size inclusive bras are made for everybody. I hope you absolutely love this Kinflight try-on as much as I have. I am obsessed with these Kinflight bras and I love the size inclusivity. You should definitely check them out, so click the link in my bio to shop. So here's the thing, like, I I understand that this very much reads like an ad, but there, I don't see, it says hashtag gifted, but clearly, but down here, there's nothing uh, listing ad, there's no hashtag ad in the the description, and down here it says paid partnership with Kinflight. So, like, why are you not disclosing that? And someone had mentioned on a William Hornby uh, video that not um, actively disclosing in the video itself that it is in fact an ad goes against uh, I think it's FCC guidelines or uh, rules or laws or something like that I need to look more into that myself but like what the fuck are you doing I don't under I don't care if this says gifted if it says down here paid partnership with Kinflight that means you were paid it wasn't gifted this is so misleading I was going to initially go past this if I saw, like, hashtag ad if she had disclosed in here that it was, in fact, an ad. Um, and I understand that it reads as an ad, but at the same time, this this is one of those things where it's like, it says paid partnership. You were paid to make this video, clearly. But then it says gifted. Like, it was just, what is it? I don't like this. And, of course, the comments are turned off. This this is really shady on J Bay's part. I uh, I'll be curious. Oh wait, nope. It's still yeah. It still does not say add. Size so inclusive fashion, inclusive fashion, FYP, sustainable fashion, body positive, all of that. But it does not say hashtag ad. She does not mention that it is an ad. And the only um indication that we have of anything is down here in this uh text that is gray instead of white like up here so it's easier to miss and it's fucking tiny down here what the fuck J bay today i want to talk about how plus size people are harassed while average size people are praised when it comes to speaking up about airplane seats being too small i was recently tagged in a few videos where plus size people had stitched an average size woman speaking about airplane seats and how they're too small just like i've been doing she was praised in her comment section for speaking up about something that so many people agreed with. However, when I talk about it, I get harassed in the comment section and I get death threats. This kind of treatment is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about plus size discrimination. This 
Okay, so before she goes, we're going to finish listening to her. I want to be clear. I don't think that she should face harassment or death threats for um, saying that she thinks that airplane seats are too small. My only question is, what does she define as harassment? Because we've seen with the fat acceptance community that what they define as harassment and what, like, the average person would define as harassment can be two very different things. And even, like, the legal definition of harassment can be something else completely. She should not receive death threats. Um, I've been on that, that I don't, I don't think anyone should ever receive death threats for posting opinions online. Like, that's just insane to me. Political opinions, what, what have you, death threats are just not appropriate. They're not okay. But this talk about, you know, this woman is praised and basically she's not, she's, I don't know, vilified is the right word either, but like maybe shamed a little bit. Part of it is that if we take a look at you speaking out about airlines, let's take a look at that one from the, the last TikTok from the last video in which someone was stuck in an airplane seat for three hours, which you found like reprehensible on the airline's part when they did the best they could to get him out of there and how this was somehow a violation against plus size travelers. That is something completely different than someone generally complaining that airline seats are too small. Like, the airline did the best they could. If you are morbidly obese, taking up two or more seats, that goes beyond... Even the woman that's complaining about how small airline seats are can probably still fit in an airline seat. If you can't fit in an airline seat and you think that they are too small, like unreasonably small, that's something to have a conversation about. To act like though it is a violation and almost like a discrimination because you are plus size, that's what gets people angry because there's a level of entitlement there. Someone complaining about how small airline seats are, but not necessarily bringing discrimination or treating the airline as absolutely reprehensible is something different than what you were doing. And this is something else that I see with the fat acceptance group is that they will use far more extreme language to complain about something. And then when someone complains about it in a much more main, mundane, everyday way, they're like, well, why are you guys praising her? And yet I'm getting harassed. And when the language was completely different, language matters. This is one of the things that I keep saying. And this is something I've seen you guys say in the comments. Language matters. Calling something violent that isn't violent simply because you felt uh, offended or personally attacked by it is not the same as something being violent, and it devalues violence. Same thing with words like discrimination, bigotry, and um, like racism, homophobia, that's, that sort of thing. When it, you guys use those words use bigotry discrimination will sometimes even say it's akin to being racist it's akin to being homophobic as like fat phobia being akin to those things you degrade your words because i'm not going to take you seriously when you are constantly using hyperbole and extreme language to make your point because then it seems like well then no matter what you probably aren't going to be pleased you know, does that make sense? I'm hoping I'm making sense. It's one of those things where it's like, and I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to bring it to this, but it's the only example that pops into my brain. Someone misgendering a trans person is a rude asshole. Like purposefully misgendering a trans person just to be a dick is a very rude asshole and is not someone necessarily that I want to associate with. That being said, I don't see purposeful misgendering as violence against trans people. Someone physically assaulting a trans person for being trans is violence against trans people. Misgendering, even purposeful misgendering, isn't the same thing as violence. It's you. I think an argument can be made for bigotry there, and it's definitely unkind, but it's not the same as violence. This is kind of in the same vein. You can't say that, oh, this person, you know, complains about small airline seats, and I do, and yet they get praised and I get harassed. Well, you said that this is absolutely unacceptable, that it's discrimination against 
uh, plus size travelers and X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. When it's not discrimination, it's the way things that go and it's not accessible. You can argue about accessibility if you want. That's totally cool. But there are nuances to have to this conversation. And when you come at everything with a sledgehammer, you can't be surprised when people walk away from you. My favorite travel apps, part four. Viator. It's an amazing travel app that lets you discover and book awesome tours, activities, and experiences at your fingertips. Find and explore the best destinations with ease. All thanks to Viator's user-friendly interface and vast selection of options. Let's embark on unforgettable adventures together. You can click the link in my bio to find out more about Viator. My favorite travel apps, part four. Viator. So after what she did with the Kinflight bras, like she's saying click the link in my bio. This could just be a recommendation thing, but it reads exactly the same as her ads. And part of me is like, is this another ad that you just haven't disclosed? You know? I don't know. J-Bay needs to be a bit, I think, would would benefit from changing up her language and her presentation when she's simply recommending something versus when it's an ad. Or at the very, like, at the very least, as required, disclose her ads properly. I don't know. What do you, I'm vote in the comments. Ad that was undisclosed or genuine recommendation. Today, I want to talk about all those who have viewed my plus size travel petition and think that I'm asking for special treatment. The purpose of my plus size travel petition is not about special treatment, but rather fair treatment and ensuring plus size travelers have a similar experience to other passengers. The petition. So fair treatment means you get the space that you paid for. There have been, um, I've seen people talk about like plus size people that bought the second seat and uh someone brought like a baby on board and was like well can you just like squish yourself into another seat so my son can sit there uh when they did not pay for that extra seat the plus size person the fat person paid for the extra seat and to that i say fuck you the plus size person paid for the extra seat therefore it is their space that is fair treatment I don't think if you, and even if you only pay for the extra seat, so you have a place to put your shit or something, uh, that you want to, like, keep out for the flight, as far as I'm concerned, you paid for that seat. You can do with it what you fucking want. That's fair treatment. Being able to take up two seats but only pay for one, I don't, I think that is special treatment. Curious to hear your, your opinions on this one because I can kind of understand how it would go both ways. But I I definitely come down on the that getting a second seat and not having to pay for it is special treatment, not fair treatment. And I would like to hear your opinions on that. It addresses the inequalities that us plus size travelers face and aims to prioritize our comfort and safety. Many people... Okay, but comfort really isn't prioritized by anyone on airlines. From my understanding, granted, I've never traveled on, on an airplane. I, I haven't. I have not had that experience. So feel free to comment in the description, or not the description, in the comments down below if you think that your comfort is taken into consideration during airplane, tra <laughs> airplane travel. Because from my understanding, comfort isn't really a consideration for anybody. So already right there you are asking for special treatment. Um, safety, I think, comes in the realm of the uh, belt extender. And this this inequalities, the issue with the idea of inequalities around fatness is that fatness is something that you can change with lifestyle changes. Unlike the person in the wheelchair that can't diet and exercise their way out of a wheelchair. Or, uh, I know there's a lot of other disabilities, but they are not coming to mind at the moment. But there's there's other ways that people can't diet and exercise themselves out of their chronic illnesses, out of their disabilities. Morbid obesity is something that is very fixable without even medical, direct medical intervention. If you have a food addiction that you need treatment for, then that's, that's something that uh, definitely needs to be talked about and seen with your doctor. But no airplane can accommodate you out of your food addiction. That's something that you have to deal with. So anyway, opinions and we'll finish listening. 
have compared this issue to people needing extra space for napping on planes. This is far from the same thing that we're asking for. We are asking for inclusivity and accessibility, no matter our body size, shape, or weight. Laws in Australia and Canada and the Southwest Airlines customer size policy here in the United States shows that inclusive policies can be implemented successfully. With my petition, I'm striving to make positive, inclusive change in the airline industry by calling for clear guidelines and equal treatment, ensuring that plus size travelers and those who need more space have a fair experience without additional financial burdens or discrimination. If you would like to learn more about my plus size travel petition, click the link to my bio and consider signing. You'd be joining me and 30,000 other people who believe in this cause. Today, 30,000 really isn't that much for the the general scope of even just the U.S. Um, but even putting that aside, this goes back to there being things that, like, there's aspects of it that I disagree with. Clear guidelines, clear policies, transparent policies. I agree with all of that across the board, not just for the plus-size travelers. Across the board, policies and guidelines should be made readily apparent and easily accessible. Completely agree. The idea of not having additional financial burdens, uh, and I'm guessing that's by way of buying the second seat. The issue is, is that you created that additional financial burden. Again, you're, this isn't a matter of you being a wheelchair user that can't exercise and diet their way out of a wheelchair. You created the need for the second seat. You created it. It didn't happen to you. So it's just one of the, I don't, it's just one of those things where it's like, if you eat yourself to this weight, it comes with additional responsibilities, financial and otherwise. There, look, and it, the thing is, is that if we take it outside the realm of fat acceptance and we take it outside the realm of just even air travel, like I almost exclusively have to use Dove soap because my skin is so reactive and my eczema can be so absolutely insane that other soaps are hell on my hands to the point where they crack and they bleed and they're itchy and the eczema just like takes over my hands. Dove is expensive. Dove is expensive. Then like the dial soap that my, uh, family members, my other, my other family members who don't have eczema issues would use. My mom would use like the $2 dial soap if she could, because like it, it's cheapest and it doesn't affect her hands the way it affects mine. I used dial soap once and my, my hands just completely broke out in an eczema rash. So I ended up paying for the more expensive soap. Now, is that fair in this very kind of juvenile perspective of fair? No. But I recognize that it's just something, unfortunately, that I have to deal with. Like, it's not... I have the ability to buy the other soaps. It's just that the other soaps will cause issues for me. It's not a matter of um, vanity. It's not... Because I know a lot of people use Dove soap because it makes their skin soft. For me, I use Dove soap because it's the only thing that my skin seems to tolerate right now. And is that fair? It is, for me, it's not a matter of fair or not fair. It simply is what it is. And I kind of feel like it's the same thing a bit with travel. Like, you are so big that you take up two seats, therefore you have to buy two seats. It's not a matter of it being fair or unfair. It simply is what it is. Opinions? Opinions. I want to hear your opinions. Stitch this. What's one thing that happened to you in your lifetime that made you look at your body in a negative light? I'll go first. But before we get into it, I want to put a trigger warning on this video. When I was seven years old, I remember how much my mom hated my body, but she loved keeping up appearances. And this one time we had to go shopping with my aunt, which was a rare occasion. I was going to be a flower girl in her wedding. My mom used to hate taking me shopping since I was a fat kid. It was more difficult to find clothes for me and she hated that. Not to mention we were super poor, so going shopping wasn't something we did a whole lot. But I will never forget that day and this is why. We found a dress, my mom took me into the fitting room and she tried to put the dress on me and guess what? It didn't fit, but it was the first of many. My mom was super pissed off and embarrassed, and so she slapped me across the face and told me that she was embarrassed because I was fat and nothing would ever fit me. I was seven years old, so of course I started to cry. And when I left the dressing room, my aunt asked what was wrong. My mom hurried, shushed me, and said, oh, she's just upset that the dress didn't fit. But in reality, my mom had just slapped the shit out of me. I felt silenced, I felt judged, I felt shamed, and I was not looking forward to trying on more dresses that day, I can tell you that. 
I wasn't crying because the dress didn't fit. I was crying because my fat phobic mom had just abused me in the dressing room. But I was never able to tell anyone this until years later. That moment had a major impact on me and my body image for years to come. But now I just look back and I realize how strong I am and how strong I was then. And I'm so happy that I have a better relationship with my body. Despite going through things like that and much worse. So stitch this and tell me something you went through that had a negative impact on how you looked at your body. But only if you're comfortable. And please know that even if you don't love your body or accept your body as it is right now, you can get to that point no matter what. Let's come together, share our stories, and show people that no matter what you go through, you can always get to a better place and you can love your body at any size, any age, and anything in between. Ditch this. So here's the thing. I genuinely believe this story. I do. I believe this story. Um, emotionally immature parents are ubiquitous. And that emotional immaturity can sometimes lead to abusive behaviors like this. And I feel sorry for J-Babe because she, if she was seven years old when that happened and her mother is upset that she's fat, the mother is still to blame because she is the one that was feeding J-Babe. The mother was completely responsible and yet took her frustrations out on a child that had no say in the situation, that had no autonomy in the situation because she, the, I, I don't know why J-Babe's, um, weight was an issue at such a young age uh, if it was parental neglect and so JB often ate to comfort herself which I could see or if it was a like one of those parents that's like you're gonna eat everything I put on your plate they put a shit ton of food on your plate and then they then she apparently also got mad that JB gained weight when she was being forced to eat more than she needed I don't know J-Bay's background. I don't know any of this. But the the effect that it had on her self-esteem and her uh, body image was directly the fault of the mother. 100%. The mother, the parents, what, whatever you want to say. Uh, because the mom is the one that shamed her for being fat. But the mom was also the one controlling the food and the meals. And I don't know, I don't know J-Bay's full home life story but I don't really think that it's I need to know in order to say that the mother was just abusive and wrong now the issue is is that the uh, fully acknowledging that trauma and fully acknowledging that Jay Bay's weight at seven was in no way her fault that does not mean that Fat acceptance is a good ideology to buy into for me. Like, yes, your mom was abusive. Yes, she clearly gave you either unfiltered access to food or made you eat or neglected you and you ate for comfort or any number of combinations and other ways that that could have uh, manifested. That does not mean that you have no control over your weight. You had no control over your weight, not really, at seven years old you had no control that your parents had control over your weight at that point your parents had control over your weight for a good portion of your adolescence up till maybe maybe when you could drive a car and uh feed yourself and that sort of thing they that does not mean that you have no control over your weight now and this could be very much a learned helplessness sort of thing like if I don't know. I don't know J-Bay's background or any of that. I believe that this happened. I uh, believe that she faced abuse from her mother because she was a chubby kid, even though it's the mother's fault that she was chubby. But I don't think that that means that her weight is unchangeable now. I could see how changing her weight could feel insurmountable to her, though, given her background. No control over her food, was punished despite having no control. And so it kind of creates this, nothing's going to get better anyway, so I should just eat and comfort myself. But it can be changed. And it does not mean that your mom was justified at all in how she treated you. It does not mean that you were worth less as a child because you were fat. And it still does not mean that anything was in any way your fault at such a young age. But you have control now. 
and I that's I think some I think that's a big thing in the fat acceptance community is I think that there was probably some level of neglect or like JB went through abuse uh when they were young and instead of recognizing the abuse and separating the the weight criticism uh, well not separating the weight criticism but separating their ability to control their weight like that I think it's a I don't know if it's a way to cope because like if they could change their weight then does that mean their abusers were right no it doesn't so, I don't know this just this is like an aspect of the fat acceptance community that I just feel is not particularly well explored and it's I really wanted to cover more with Victoria because there's another example of this sort of thing not not exactly like this not as direct with her parents or anything like that but it's about her going to a, a fat camp as a kid um that I really really wanted to cover uh but Victoria has the past year of her video still privated so I cannot but there's, I'm seeing kind of a trend to a certain extent with um, these like big fat acceptance believers and experiencing abuse from people who had, who ultimately had control of their weight at young ages and yet still blamed them and treated them as what definitely seems as less than as a res uh, because of their weight. And I feel like that's kind of co colored their whole perspective. We're reaching all the time I can devote to this video today. So I am going to just talk a little bit about my job before I sign off. So I, um, we have these days that we have to come in before the beginning of the school year. And my God, I am not used to getting up at fucking 5 a.m. That's probably the hardest part <laughs> of my new job. But Along with that, so I'm working as an ESL teacher. A lot's been kind of piled on pretty quickly, but I don't think that it's, like, intentional. I think there's just, like, there's no systems in place for teachers or anything. Like, I thought I was going to be kind of in more of a support teacher role uh, because there's another MLL teacher, but it kind of turns out that I'm, like, the primary MLL teacher, which is fine. But something I'm realizing is that staff have been given no real tools on how to work with ESL students. There's no systems in place. I've worked, I did my student teaching at a school that had three times, at least three times the number of students uh, that this school does in the, uh, in the ESL program. But this is much more difficult because there are no systems in place. There is staff does not know how to handle these students there's a lot of anxiety around these students and I'm kind of managing all that as a first year teacher and it's a little overwhelming it's just a touch overwhelming I don't and while I've been given a lot of requests and when I'm like I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that within the timeline because they're also giving me like really tight timelines I am getting a little bit of pushback I don't think that it's I, I think it's just a matter that a lot of staff doesn't realize that I also have a shit ton of paperwork to do regarding these students in the district level. And so, like, just not not everything's going to be put in place, especially when we have no systems in place for these students. Uh, not everything's going to be ready before the first day of school. It's I, I have four days before the beginning of school to get things figured out, pretty much. Uh, and even then I'm getting information in a trickle. So there's been like, there's just constant revisions to send out. I'm sending out so many emails and it's just, it's a little overwhelming. I, it's gonna, I know the system and I know this and I know it's going to smooth out after about the first month, but it's, it's a little overwhelming right now. Um, but I'm thankful that I was at, I student taught at a school that had so many systems in place that I can kind of implement, but I just wasn't prepared to be the one implementing all of them, you know? People don't, like, this, it's a school that has a growing ESL community. They're just not used to it, and no one knows. So I have so, like, I have so many teachers, 
like how do I handle this? What do I what do I do? What do I like and I'm I'm like I'm I'm promising you I will get to you. I'm doing my best, but I literally I'm not even a full time teacher there. I'm not even a half time teacher. I am a point four. I am there fifteen hours a week. And I don't I'm also trying to like I wanna help them, but I also don't wanna do the work of a full time teacher as a point four and spend so much time that I'm not getting paid for working on this stuff and because also because this is a growing position and so if I do go up next year then even more is going to be expected of me I am just kind of navigating when to turn things off how to prioritize things and how to implement things without my life becoming my job you know with that I'm going to leave this here for today. Uh, let me know what you thought of J-Bay and some of the stuff she said. I'd love to see it in the comments and read your opinions. Uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.